And we said, not a joke. It was just purely coincidental. She said, I love the carpenters. She said, the first outfit that endorsed me when I ran for attorney general uh, for the, the DA in San Francisco <clears throat> was, the, was the carpenters. And I said, I remember mine well, a guy named Cal McCullough, president of the Carpenters Union from Newcastle, Delaware, one of the 350-year-old city on the Delaware River, uh, was the first one to endorse me as well. And so, you know, uh, you've been with me my whole career. And President Doug McCarran has been a longtime friend. We've worked together a long time. 520,000 carpenters. That's an incredible army to have behind you. And uh, you, you are, I'm telling you. <clears throat> you have, you have my whole career, and I hope you know I've had yours as well. You know, there's an old expression <clears throat> when I was growing up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He said, you go home with them to bring you to the dance. Well, the carpenters brought me to the dance, and you're going home together. You're going to have a seat at the table. Folks, you know, uh, people who uh, shape the skyline, who build the foundations, everything we rely on, are the carpenters. Labor brought me to the dance, and the only reason I'm able to run for president is because, standing here today, because of labor. You know, I've never forgotten everything uh, you've done for me and uh, you've done for the country. I really mean it. You know, uh, I, I get in trouble for saying this, but it's true. Uh, you're the backbone of America. You're the spine of America. You're the ones who actually built the country, not Wall Street bankers and CEOs. You're the ones who are going to rebuild it again. And you're going to build it back better. For real. Kamala and I can't thank you enough. And folks, I don't, uh, I don't know if you caught it, but uh, the Senator had a heck of a night last night. <laughs> I tell you what, you got to give me great credit for knowing how to pick him, right? I mean, <laughs> I couldn't be prouder. He's like a younger sister, but I couldn't be prouder to be running alongside such a leader with remarkable character and vision, and who always, always, always is looking out for the people. Always somebody else, not her. Always. And I want to tell you something. It's uh, Kamala and I are about to kick off a tour visiting businesses in this community. Uh, and the businesses, small business in this community, and all communities, are more responsible for more jobs than in, in the community, local small business owners, they're busting their necks than the major corporations. You add it all up, for real. Small businesses create more jobs in America than the major corporate entities. And they make, and this, this community has found itself having to go through some really challenging times. I need not tell the congressman that. He's forgotten more about it than most people know. And like, uh, um, uh, like Chef Savannah, Chef Savannah owns two restaurants here in Phoenix. One, uh, she had to, both when she when they were struck by COVID, she had to close one of them down, and she's working hard to keep the other one afloat. Barrio Cafe, which we're going to be visiting later this afternoon, but it isn't easy. You know, uh, the loan Savannah was able to secure back in the spring because of the legislation passed by the Democrats in the House uh, helped her uh, for a little while, but it wasn't nearly enough. She's scraping by week to week trying to look out for her 10 employees, some of whom have been with her for decades. And on top of that, she's facing, and I have permission to say this, she's facing a terminal disease. Silvana had to cancel her own health insurance after finishing a round of treatment recently just to make ends meet. It's devastating, and it's heartbreaking, and it's wrong. Every American should be upset about what Silvana is going through, I think you all are, I know I am, because I know, we know, it didn't have to happen. If it had just done what you passed, just move forward. And then I'll talk about it in a minute, but Savannah's story is an increasingly common story for Arizona workers and small business owners. Too many Arizonans are facing hard times right now. They're trying their best, but it never feels like it's enough. You're not looking out for a handout, they're just looking for a fair shot. Just want an even shot. That's all they're looking for. And that's how my dad felt. When he couldn't find work in Scranton, when Cole died, uh, he had to uh, move on. I remember him taking us, what I call, the longest walk any parent has to make up a short flight of stairs to tell their kid, honey, I'm sorry, but 
You can't go back to St. Paul's. You can't go play in that little league anymore. Dad's lost his job. There's no job here. I'm going to have to move. I remember him taking us to our, our grandpa's house. Me and my brother and my sister and my mom was certainly going to have another child. And we all went home. I thought about how hard it must have been for my dad. So many people in this town have done the same thing. Have to go to his father-in-law, the father of four boys and a girl, and say, and Rose, can you take, can I, I have to ask you a favor. I know how much pride it cost him. Can you take care of him for a year? I'll be back. I promise I'll come home every weekend. It was only 159 miles, but it seemed like the end of the world then. But he went down, and by the time he was able to get a good job, a job enough to get us an apartment in a place called Claymont, Delaware, because he had been raised in Wilmington, Delaware. He ended up then getting a good job, a decent job, managing a car dealership. He worked hard to build a decent middle-class life, <clears throat> but it wasn't easy for him. He, he had an expression. He'd always say, and I realize, I mean this sincerely, he said, Joe, I don't expect the government, I don't expect the government to solve my problems, but I sure in hell expect them to at least understand my problems, just to understand them. And America, I think, deserves a president who understands what the American people are going through, who sees who you are, what you want to be, who cares about your health, your prosperity, your dream, your American dream. They're facing real challenges right now. And the last thing you need is a president who exacerbates them, who ignores you. And I'm going to say it. I've been saying it for a while. It's from my perspective was grand. A president who looks down at us, who thinks that if you, uh, if you put your life on the line for the nation, you're a loser, a sucker. So we were talking about with Cindy. My Bo, my son Bo, who just passed, not just, passed away. Now it's going on five years, it seems like yesterday. Won the Bronze Star, Conspicuous Service Medal. He was a volunteer, he was the Attorney General, but he volunteered, had to get a, an exception to be able to go to Iraq for a year. And uh, I, kept, I promise you, he wasn't a loser. He wasn't a sucker. He, like all the veterans we met with this afternoon alongside Cindy McCain, they're patriots. They're people who understand that being an American is about recognizing there's some things bigger than yourself. Cindy's husband, John McCain, who I had the great privilege of him asking me to do his eulogy, we used to argue like hell. We were like two brothers. We'd fight like hell. But we always, always, always ended up together. And that's how it used to be. It used to be that way across the board. He wasn't a loser. They're all heroes. And you know what? They deserve better than a president who will say anything to deflect responsibility for any mistake he makes. I don't know if you noticed, he uh, recently said that, when I asked him where he got the COVID, he said, I probably got it from Blue Star parents. They're people who lost a child in battle. He said, because they like to get close to me and hug me. I don't know how to say no. Look, we've paid too high a price already for Donald Trump's chaotic, divisive leadership. <clears throat> More than 210,000 Americans have lost their lives to this virus. We lose more every single day. Nearly 6,000 Arizonans have been lost. Nearly 6,000. Gone. Gone. More than 220,000 Arizonans have been affected, infected with COVID. 122,000 jobs in Arizona still haven't come back. Nine, nine times more Arizonans are on unemployment each week than before this crisis hit. But businesses like Silvana's restaurant are closing. Schools aren't back to normal because Donald Trump can't focus on what matters. <clears throat> when the House passed the so-called HEROES Act, that's the second big package they passed to keep get people on their feet again some time ago. But the President, Mitch McConnell, did nothing to move the legislation. A lot of cities and states are going bankrupt because they have to balance their budgets. Our founders are pretty smart. The reason they wrote the Constitution the way they did is the Congress, the Senate, the House, the government, could deficit spend in order to compensate for being able to make sure we got out of a hole. Trump is spending more time. I've, I've been calling on this, as you probably know, for the last four months. 
He should get out of his bunker and out of the sand trap on his golf courses. Not a joke. I mean, think about it. He never once, I've been around a while, he never one single time tried to bring Democrats and Republicans together in the White House to try to get a settlement. Not once. You can't name me a president in the lifetime of any of you that refused to deal that way in the middle of a crisis. But the leadership of Congress together to resolve the issue is something that's running on his watch. And on Tuesday, and Congressman, I'm sure you were probably not surprised by it, but on Tuesday, he announced he's walking away from negotiations to provide additional relief for working people, mom and pop businesses, schools, or just go down the line. On October 8th, exactly two months since the emergency small business program was closed. Two months of small business owners in Arizona and across the country waiting and hoping for just a little bit of help to be able to stay open. More than 400,000 small businesses have permanently closed nationwide. 400,000. Millions are struggling to hang on. The legislation has already been passed. It's there. I handle what they call the Recovery Act when we inherited a Great Recession. I had the ability to deal with $800 billion spent in 18 months. All the outside groups point out less than two-tenths of 1 percent waste or fraud. But you know what we did? We provided $148 billion to the cities and states so the, you didn't have to lay off cops, firefighters, sanitation workers. You didn't, have to hire, you didn't have to lay off nurses, close down county hospitals. You kept it open. And America got through it and began to generate the longest period of recovery in modern history. How many more have to go under? How many more dreams have to be extinguished? because this president threw in the towel. Instead of focusing on your needs, he's still trying to take care of, take away your health care. I mean, think about that. I mean, just think about it. I mean, if, if I, I, I'm not, but if I were a playwright, I'm writing a play, there isn't a single solitary outfit in Broadway that would take it, because it sounds like ridiculous fiction. In the middle of a pandemic, when already 10 million Americans have lost their employer-based insurance because the employer went under. He's trying to take away insurance from another 22 million people who got it for the first time in the pre-existing conditions that the senator talked about. He's in the Supreme Court right now asking to strike down the Affordable Care Act, the entirety of it. Take away Medicare benefits for seniors. People don't realize how deep this goes and taking us back to a time when insurers could deny coverage because of pre-existing condition. I want you to understand this. Women's rights are — I'm not talking about the right to choose now. Women's rights are — you realize, before we passed — Barack and I passed the law, pregnancy was considered a pre-existing condition. Not a joke. Insurance companies were allowed to charge more for a woman for the same exact medical procedure that a man would have. Same one. And look what's happened. Minority communities were devastated. But he's done beyond that. He's vowed, and this isn't even getting much attention because so much chaos is going on. He vowed to, quote, terminate the funding source for Social Security. That's the withholding tax you pay, you know, for Social Security, 6.5%. He wants to terminate it. So it makes it look like you got more in your paycheck. But the actuary at the Social Security Department said, if he does that, Social Security will be bankrupt by the middle of 2023. Benefits for more than a million Arizonans rely on the whole idea of a dignified retirement. The fact is, President Trump can only see the world from Park Avenue. He thinks that Wall Street built America. 
That's why he let big corporations jump into the front lines and get the recovery money that the congressman helped pass while small businesses struggle to stay open. But people don't know because it's so complicated. So much is happening. Congressman can tell you, congressman can tell you there was an inspector general that they appointed, meaning somebody who had independent capacity to look into anything that was being done on the money being spent, okay? I had an inspector general overlooking the $800 billion I was responsible for. Twice, every two weeks, I met with him in detail, so we knew exactly where the money was going. What's the first thing the president did? Wiped out the — he fired the inspector general. Think about that now. Forty percent of all the money that was supposed to go to small businesses in the first time around went to the Mar-a-Lago crowd, the wealthy. No, I'm not — you think — I mean, if this wasn't so true, I'd be re reluctant to say it because it sounds so bizarre. This president has forgotten the people who said he'd fight for. I'll never forget because I see the world from where I grew up in Scranton and Claymont, a little steel town. I know that the middle class, working class built this country, and unions built the middle class. And I measure economic success for what families are talking about sitting around their kitchen tables, about having a decent job and benefits, about keeping a small business dream alive, about the, the conversations that took place this morning. Well, we need four new tires. The tires are bald in the car. Well, we got to wait. We can't afford to get them. Can't do it. Who's going to tell her she can't go back to the community college because we just can't borrow any money anymore? Or you have 20 million people today, 20 million people, including here in Arizona, who are worried about whether they can pay this month's mortgage payment. 20 million. And look at all the people who are worried they're going to be thrown out in the street because they can't pay their rent. These guys provided for all that. But nothing. Being able to look your kids in the eye. My dad used to say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. And mean it. And mean it. Well, that's what Kamala and I are focused on. Say to our kids, honey, it's going to be okay. That's what we're talking about. We're going to get this virus under control. We're going to reopen safely and strongly, creating good paying jobs working to end this era of rancor and division. Because if we're going to get anything done, we have to do it together. I've been saying this since I announced that people thought it's being naive. They said, oh, you got a lot of things done, Joe, before, but that was the past. Well, guess what? If we can't bring the country together, we're dead. This is a democracy. It depends on a consensus. You've got to bring people together. It was somewhat maybe presumptuous me, but I made a major speech I worked really, really hard on for a long time at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And I did it two days ago. And I talked about, in Lincoln terms, that we have to bring America together. We can't hold grudges. I'm running as a proud Democrat with a capital D, but I will be an American president. I'm a Democratic president. I'll work for as hard for those who didn't support me, I promise you, and look at my record, as those who did support me. Because the fact is, that's the job of a president. It's a duty to care for everybody, not just who voted for you. After all we've been through, all America's accomplished, all the years we've stood as a beacon to the world, we cannot allow ourselves to remain divided. We have the ultimate power in our hands. You know what that power is? That little sticker you have on. The power to vote. Oh, really? Really? You can still register here in Arizona to vote. Early voting's already begun. 
And the vast majority of Arizonans vote by mail. And those mail-in ballots will start arriving in the next couple of days. So Kamala and I are saying to you, the best thing you can do is return your ballot quickly. Don't risk delays. Return that mail-in ballot as soon as you can. And make sure your voice is heard. Because if your voice can overcome and go out and vote, your voice through your vote can overcome every one of the challenges we face. And by the way, you know what they're setting up. They're setting up the argument that these votes aren't going to matter. You saw what happened today. The FBI arrest arrested a group of militiamen who had planned, had a plan to go in and to kidnap the governor of Michigan. You know, see it in the news tonight. The governor of Michigan. Remember those guys with the assault rifles standing in their driveway? And the president saying things in my debate with him, like to the Proud Boys, an all-white supremacist group, stand down but stand ready. This is serious stuff. We can't just win by a vote. We've got to all turn out. We can be better than we've seen. We can be what we are at our best if we all get out and vote. And at our best, we're the United States of America. And all kidding aside, it's not some prosaic thing. The fact is, America's never, 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 ever failed when we've stood up together. We're the only nation in the world that's come out of every single crisis, war or economic crisis, stronger than when we went into the crisis. So, folks, I'm more optimistic today about America's chances at home and in the world than I've ever been. I've been around a long time. I've worked with a lot of presidents. I really mean it. We have a chance, a chance, not only to improve our country, but to change the world. We have the most powerful military in the history of the world. But that's not why the rest of the world repairs to us. It's not, it's not the example of our power. It's been the power of our example that has the rest of the world follow us. And that example is being trashed around the world. As the senator said last night in the debate, it's true. 17 major countries in the world are asked, who, what, what leaders did they admire the most, trust the most? The Pew Foundation, it's Pew, I think. Yeah. You know what they said? More people trusted Xi Jinping of China and, and, Putin of Russia and the President of the United States. That has profound security as well as economic impact. So, folks, let's not quit. There's no quit in America. We have never, ever, 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 ever quit. And if we need you to stand up at any time in our history, we need you now. Thank you for being here. God bless you, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.